Hello, everyone. My name is Zach Canizzo from the Marine Protected Area Center. Welcome to the Marine Protected Area Center webinar series co-presented by OCTO. Today's webinar is addressing marine debris in protected areas, best examples, practices, best practices and examples. And our presenter is Dr. Anna Ruth Roebuck. Uh, Dr. Roebuck is an environmental chemist and marine scientist. Her research bridges analytical chemistry, oceanography, geography, and ecology to answer questions about the sources, fate, and impacts of chemical and plastic pollution in coastal and marine food webs. Roebuck is currently a NOAA Nancy Foster Scholar, as well as a postdoctoral ORISE research fellow placed within the US EPA and a trainee in the NIEHS Superfund Research Program. Roebuck has received recognition for her expansive thinking to marine <clears throat> Thinking to marine pollution, including the NIEHS Casey Donnelly externship in 2020, the Robert and Patricia Schweitzer Foundation Environmental Research, Research Fellowship, Leadership Fellowship in 2019, and the American Chemical Society Environmental Chemistry Graduate Student Award in 2020. She has also supported mentoring and planning initiatives in several municipalities and protected areas via staff and res staff or research roles. She holds a BS in Marine Biology and Chemistry and a Master's of Science in Marine Science and GIS, both from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Roebuck. Zach, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the introduction and I wanna thank everyone for joining today. I'm excited to chat with you all about this topic. So to, oops, to dive right in, um, within this presentation, I'm going to be discussing some highlights from the work I've been doing over the past few months with the Marine Protected Area Center. And the full details of this collaboration are available in a forthcoming report. This analysis examines current and potential practices to address marine debris in MPAs alongside current research from government, academic, and nonprofit organizations. And the point of this is to pinpoint the optimal ways and means for MPAs to engage on this issue. The report includes the conceptual framework that we're going to address here today, as well as specific case study examples and other recommendations. The report itself was a bit delayed due to COVID related hiccups, but will be available online within the next few weeks and also emailed to webinar participants once it does come online. So today I'd like to start with some background about the topic and then provide some context about currently ongoing research and policy to frame why this is a great time to actively engage on marine debris. I'll then move on to the meat of the presentation, describing the conceptual framework I developed within the scope of this collaboration to really encourage marine protected area engagement on this issue. So as the images here suggest, marine debris is a broad topic. The definition itself covers a wide range of materials and sizes, ranging from derelict vessels all the way to microplastics. Around 80% of marine debris is thought to be plastic, so today we're going to especially focus on ocean plastic pollution, since it is such a key player, and secondarily on derelict fishing gear. The diversity of marine debris arises due to the diversity of sources that contribute these materials to the environment. About 80% of marine debris is thought to arise from several types of land-based sources, while maybe about 20% arises from maritime sources like fishing and shipping. But I'll note here that this ratio widely varies depending on geographic location, as some places are disproportionately impacted by one type versus another. For example, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is now known to be primarily composed of derelict fishing gear, while many continental locations along the coasts of the US experience a high degree of plastic consumer debris related to mismanagement of products. I'll also point out here that oftentimes the fishing gear makes up a lot more by mass, whereas the plastic products themselves can make up more by abundance. But you know, regardless of specific makeup, the expansive scope of the problem is a enormous management challenge for MPAs and other organizations as any entity seeking to address this issue has to expect to deal with a range of um, concerns and challenges depending on the location, the season, natural disaster activity, stakeholder engagement. And so no one solution is really right to address every type and size of marine debris and every angle of the actual problem itself. So while physically very diverse, many types of marine debris are alike in their proclivity to cause impacts in marine systems. 
Impacts related to marine debris have been documented from the cellular level up to the species or population level. But it's still safe to say that our understanding of impacts is still quite patchy in that some existing research will really focus on one species or, or one tissue type. I want to point out that the invasive species example photo here is kind of the hardest to see. That's up in the top right corner. And this is a photo of a floating dock that washed up on the Oregon coast related to the 2011 tsunami, bringing along invasive species with it. So as a truly transboundary problem, marine debris occurs in marine protected areas around the globe and can impart the same harmful impacts in these special places. The map background here overlays three different data sets that documented marine debris across the globe. Those are depicted in blue, um, where the boundaries of MPAs are documented with the, the green polygons that you see on the slide. The blue dots correspond to the number of surveys, and that changes depending on your zoom. And I want to point out here that those dots are indicative of effort. And yet, even with this effort corrected data, we still see abundant overlap of marine debris occurrence through these surveys within MPA boundaries. This map is available with the web story that's also associated with this project. Um, so you can certainly take a look at this more closely. So while we may be seeking to constrain impacts and document debris across a lot of different habitats, our knowledge of some key characteristics of the marine debris problem have rapidly grown over the past five to 10 years. Whoops, it doesn't look like it's advancing on my end. Oh, there we go, sorry about that. Um, so for example, the Global Ghost Gear Initiative estimated in 2018 that over 640,000 tons of ghost gear is left or lost in the ocean each year due to problems related to fisheries overlap, net maintenance, and overall awareness or education. Another 2019 study estimated that 6% of all nets, 9% of all traps, and 29% of all lines are lost around the world, again, each year. Considering plastic pollution, a highly publicized research paper in 2015 suggested that around 8 million metric tons of mismanaged plastic waste enter the ocean each year using 2010 data. A lot of work has followed up on that paper to point out that much of the plastic conjectured to be entering the ocean each year may be buried in the deep sea or along coastlines. Other research has emerged to suggest that rivers, in particular a few um, large rivers contribute a substantial portion of land-derived plastic each year. The most recent research released in 2020 updated that previous estimate to say that up to 23 million metric tons of plastic waste enter the ocean each year, or excuse me, as of 2016. And the U.S. is the number one generator of plastic waste and among the largest contributors of plastic to the global ocean when the analysis more accurately notes that most recycled materials in the U.S. are not truly recycled. Finally, a recent study performed an ecosystem impact analysis, looking at ecosystem services and how they may be impacted by marine debris, and found that each ton of marine debris is associated with up to $33,000 of economic loss in lost ecosystem services. Using that most recent estimate of plastic emissions with that figure, this means that up to about $760 billion of economic cost are incurred each year from marine debris alone. So as well, a 2019 report explored the inherent link between plastics and climate change. And I want to point out that this was a fascinating part of my research. I didn't know a lot of this before coming to this project. And the report and other literature shows that plastic production and use emits greenhouse gases at every stage. So in particular, this report found that if plastic production and use grow as currently planned, by 2030, the production of plastic could be releasing greenhouse gas emissions that are more than 295 new 500 megawatt coal-fired power plants, or the equivalent to that. The report also suggested that due to the tremendous increase of plastic production predicted, emissions related to plastic production itself could reach 10 to 13 percent of the global carbon budget by 2050. The policy space surrounding marine debris and plastic pollution is also rapidly growing. 
including legislation passed in 2020 in the US to revitalize the recycling system. The US also committed to the Global Ghost Gear Initiative in 2020 to um, better address ghost gear and derelict fishing gear. There's also a commitment by Indonesia, one of the largest contributors to ocean plastic, to become a zero plastic emission country by 2040. And finally, on January 1st, uh, 2021, the Basel Convention was amended to include stricter controls on the global movement of recyclable plastics to ensure low income countries are not inundated with plastics they can't feasibly recycle. Um, I'll note here, however, that the US has not ratified the Basel Convention. These national and international efforts come amidst a groundswell of local and regional efforts to address plastic pollution and marine debris at smaller scales. But unfortunately, existing management and mitigation efforts are not going to solve this problem. And that's unfortunate to have to say so bluntly, but this is supported by a, a couple recent studies, um, the most recent of which was published by the Pew, Char Pew Charitable Trust, which reported that current commitments and schemes to cut plastic emissions to the oceans fall well below short of intended goals. And that's depicted here in this red line, um, suggesting that plastic pollution to the ocean is going to continue to increase over the next 20 years. However, the group modeled that a systems change approach that incorporates multiple upstream and downstream existing solutions commensurately can cut plastic leakage into the ocean by about 80% below projected business as usual levels. And that's depicted in this figure as the purple line on the graph. Oops. So to this point, I've shared some of these key findings in hopes of highlighting that this is an exciting and advantageous time to engage with marine debris. We know a lot about the problem, but we also know a lot about viable solutions. And so we can ride this wave of insight to meaningfully address this issue. And kind of the, the whole point of this analysis is that marine protected areas have some unique opportunities to contribute here. So as many folks on this call know better than me, MPAs contend with many sensitive issues, often doing so with limited personnel and finite financial resources. So when I first started this analysis, my first question was, what qualities or strengths are MPAs already bringing to this fight? And so by comparing MPA characteristics and governments to other initiatives tackling debris, I found that in a bulk sense, marine protected areas possess some unique incentives and advantages to address this problem. So first and foremost, MPAs conserve some of the most special natural and cultural resources around the globe. This provides a heightened imperative to prevent harm from marine debris in these unique places, given that we have already identified them as communities and nations as worthy or appropriate for protection. The existing focus on valuable resources may also translate to increased buy-in from funders, communities, and stakeholders to address the problem that may be harder to build in places not um, already conserved. MPA boundaries themselves can actually be considered somewhat an advantage here as well, as they provide a more specific geographic frame to what is otherwise a very broad and wide ranging issue that can be overwhelming. It's easier to think about and design solutions to address marine debris in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, for example, compared to the entire North Atlantic Ocean. The spatial coverage of protected areas around the globe also encompasses a significant portion of global and regional seas, though we know this does vary by, by nation. But this, this coverage suggests that any concerted effort to address marine debris across some or all of the global expanse of protected area has the potential to cover far more territory than any existing initiative in place, and therefore could have the potential to bring about far greater impact than some efforts targeting specific localities or regions. And so for very rough illustrative purposes here, I want to just you know, offer a hypothetical example of the potential impact of protected areas addressing this issue. And so let's, let's assume we achieve the 30 by 30 protection goals. And within that coverage, half of MPAs that are um, currently um, designed or implemented commit to removing one eighth of the marine debris within their boundaries. And again, using a very rough back of the envelope kind of calculation, this could equate to the mitigation of up to 3 million metric tons of marine debris based on current estimates of cumulative debris in the environment. We'll talk more about this later, but I also wanna point out here that there's no coordinated and sustained national or international survey of marine debris across multiple types of marine habitat 
marine protected areas may be a great platform to consider in bringing such an effort to fruition, considering their spatial extent and the representativeness of valued ecosystems. Next, we have existing infrastructure and mission. And this is an advantage because MPA managers and personnel are already focused on conservation in dynamic stakeholder environments. And so this means that this, these organizations and, and folks are more ready to mobilize on another type of environmental challenge while incorporating lessons learned from other transboundary issues like climate change, all the while doing this in the midst of a culturally relevant framework in a, a local environment. MPAs are also more likely to possess increased authority and expertise in the stakeholder spaces that they are already part of, given their governance and mission are already recognized in environmental and community spheres. And this is important to lend, excuse me, this is important to lend some authority and importance to the issue overall. And then finally, um, on a logistical basis, MPAs are more likely to possess existing infrastructure, such as maybe monitoring equipment, a vessel, or some field gear, or um, education um, materials to perform monitoring or implement education or some of the other initiatives that I'll discuss here today. And finally, we have connectivity. So, Marine protected areas are inherently designed to be connected to each other and the communities where they are located. And so this means by their very design, they are operating within networks, multifaceted stakeholder environments, and different social and cultural frameworks. And this is a huge advantage as these sorts of relationships and knowing how to cultivate these relationships is vital for any effort tackling marine debris. Because I want to point out here, and I'll emphasize this a couple times, that engaging many stakeholders was a recurring theme I identified in most successful ongoing efforts tackling marine debris. The problem is too expansive to try to take on as an, an individual organization or even as an individual. So as I hope I've convinced you to this point, MPAs have many advantages and incentives coming to this issue. But beyond the why, I sought to figure out the what. What are the big picture tasks or tools best for protected areas to prioritize given their unique operating environments and constraints? And amidst the wide range of options available and ongoing, this, my analysis suggests that it makes the most sense for MPAs to act on this issue by inspiring value-driven behavior change to turn off the debris tap through experiential learning and education, while also facilitating monitoring and debris removal to address the debris already in the environment. This is totally not to say other options are you know, not viable or off limits. There are so many ways to tackle this issue, but here I'm solely suggesting that these two approaches have a lot of potential, giving some of the specific constraints, pressures, and strengths that MPAs are operating within. So to dive into these points a little further, first and foremost, the most important thing MPAs can do is inspire and cultivate self-motivated action and awareness on this topic. And at this point, I assume that there's a lot of folks hopefully patting themselves on the back because this may be something that you are already, already doing or, or thinking about. But I want to highlight this as such an important element of the marine debris problem as I evaluated a range of dryer, drivers that impact, excuse me, a range of drivers that inspire action on marine debris, drawing a lot here on behavioral science and risk assessment literature and reports. And you'll see that those factors I identified that are considered external drivers are listed in blue. And these are tools like bag bans or littering fines that encourage pro-environmental behavior through some kind of directive or leverage framework. But research says that these external drivers can certainly help address marine debris and can play a very important role, but once the external force is removed or lifted, folks are inclined to resume the debris causing behavior, sometimes without hesitation. So a timely example of this is the recent surge in single use plastics associated with COVID. Cultural and social norms often promote disposable plastic as the safer and cleaner alternative. So across the globe, the Product Stewardship Institute has documented a major backslide of plastic policy and a surge of plastic use as people revert to old habits without some of these policies in place. 
limited studies so far also document a drastic increase in plastic emissions to the aquatic environment over the course of this pandemic. I do want to say that obviously public health is important and when plastic su uh, supports that, it is vital to use it for that tool. And yet in some places, plastic bag bans, for example, um, we've, we've really backslid there without any evidence of necessarily that helping so much. So this isn't to say that external tools like policy aren't valuable, but for optimal results, we need to prioritize creating an internal desire to prevent marine debris so that laws and policies end up being more effective and continued as extensions of pervasively shared and established value systems. And so that brings me to the second part of of this problem, or excuse me, of this objective in that we have internal drivers of action that promote awareness and action on marine debris. These are identified here in green, and these are personally held values and beliefs that drive self-motivated action regardless of the policies in place. Folks who describe themselves as holding these beliefs or knowledge are more likely to behave in pro-environmental behavior regardless of the policy framework in place. So these intrinsic motivators are most effectively developed through experiences of nature and education. For example, research recently found that people who spent time in nature at least once a week were more significantly likely to engage with uh, conservation behaviors and report a love of nature. And marine protected areas by their very designation come equipped with some of the best resources to build such nature appreciation and values as they protect some of the most important and compelling natural places around the globe. A growing body of research is also saying that this nature experience paradigm translates to marine debris in that ocean experiences, ocean literacy, and firsthand encounters with marine debris on beaches translates to increased attention to prevent ocean plastics as well as increased participation in beach cleanup activities. I pointed the development of these values and mindsets as a key objective for MPAs because again, many sites and programs already prioritize developing connection to nature and the ocean through stewardship, engaging interpretation, outreach, and education, meaning that they are already putting in the work to develop several of these intrinsic motivators through experience and education platforms. As examples, there are initiatives like Get in Your Sanctuary, Find Your Park, Every Kid in a Park, associated with some protected areas here in the States. And so continuing to prioritize this work is a meaningful no regret solution that stands to reap dividends with the marine debris problem if this work is uh, angled as such to include marine debris especially. Given we are very much in the grip of COVID, I wanna point out that the connectivity to the ocean and nature experience can still be fostered remotely. A recent study found that folks who just watch nature programming once a week reported high connectivity to the nature to the nature, excuse me, high connectivity to nature, um, increased conservation behaviors, and overall higher well-being. I want to highlight that Sanctuaries offers a great existing example of how to encourage it, such immersive experience, despite COVID constraints, with their virtual dives video gallery and lesson plan resources that they have at the link here. And so the um, next part is Sorry, on my end, this looks like it's sticking. I'm not sure what everyone else is seeing at this moment. Um, let's give it just one second to catch up. Um, Anna, we're currently seeing life cycle literacy is essential for systems change. Oh, okay, you know, I'm sorry that it, it was hung up on, on my side for just a second. Um, if you guys are seeing that, that is where we should be. So I will I will continue moving, moving ahead. Um, so the other component of this first of objective is life cycle liber literacy and habitat building. We need to move from a place of thinking that we are throwing trash or debris away to a place of recognizing that there is no away. To get to this place, we first need to pop the benefits bubble. The linear life cycle of plastics and nets and other debris items means that we see the benefits associated with their use, like consumer use of plastics or a great um, fish trawl with, with nets, but we often don't see the impacts related to their end of life disposal because the benefits and impacts are spatially and temporally disconnected. To behavioral research backs this up, reporting that folks that know 
about marine plastic pollution as a problem, but often may not relate their daily plastic use to the problem in any tangible way, meaning they aren't thinking about marine debris every morning when they reach for a plastic shampoo bottle, for example. Surveys of fishers relate the same in that fishers may not be aware that lost gear can so significantly impact natural resources and their livelihoods. MPAs can act here by modeling their life cycle in operation, as well as teaching these skills across a wider frame. Oops. So I want to point out that this is perhaps the most important recommendation of all that I'm going to offer today when we are really considering the scope of the problem at hand. Marine debris is inherently a behavior and choice problem, and we really need to connect our behavior and choices to the grim environmental consequences that we are seeing develop. This is reinforced by that Pew report I mentioned earlier, which suggests that the systems change approach requires upstream solutions and a drastic change of consumer and user habits to meaningfully stem the tide of debris entering the ocean. But these upstream habits can only be achieved by being taught how to participate in a zero or low waste environment. The conceptual grasp of this is just not enough as oftentimes these skills are in direct contrast to some of our cultural and social norms. So conceptual understanding itself can also sometimes be misleading. So for example, we, we know that recycling is really important, but um, the idea that all plastics are recyclable can really lead to problems within the recycling system. And so as mentioned, we need to be taught how to do things, particularly at the, the wide end of this inverted pyramid here. We need to be taught how to pick out non-plastic items, purchase bulk foods, properly clean reusable items, pick out plastic products most likely to be recycled or repair clothing or nets. And we need to be taught how to do these things on a community specific basis. And this is where the ties to the community are so important in MPA designation, meaning that skill development must meet people in their unique cultural and social backgrounds to ensure that those skills are accessible. And not only do or, or should we know how to do these things, but we also need to ensure that these choices and skills are viable for a range of communities to ensure that such life cycle literacy is not reserved for high income countries or communities. And so as an example of tangible skills and practice and you know why they're important, I want to run, th run through just one you know recycling example. And recycling is often easy to pick on. I do want to say it is a very important tool. Um, so I'm not I'm not purposely trying to pick on it here, but on the slide I have a number of plastic items. And I want you to just take five seconds and me mentally take notes of which ones you think may or may not be recyclable or which ones you've you've recycled in the past. And so um, a brief, brief pause there. Um, and so as it turns out, most of these have significant problems being recycled in some of the most common recycling facilities that we have here in the US. That paper cup actually has a plastic liner inserted within the paper that makes it not recyclable with other papers. That plastic bottle for detergent, um, such highly colored plastics oftentimes have trouble being recycled and may not be, it may be too expensive to recycle, for example, depending on the uh, capabilities of your, your local facility. Um, same goes for that blue beverage bottle. Depending on how your local facility is equipped to deal with colored plastics, it might be too colored to be viably included with some of the, the chipping and, um, and further reuse strategies Im implemented in recycling facilities. And then finally, those plastic food sachets, um, though they're plastic, they're oftentimes made of mixed plastics and they can't viably be recycled in most facilities. And so, but often um, these, these items and others like it will make their way into recycling streams regardless as wishful recycling habits um, are, are widely imposed in the absence of concrete skills. And so a great example of life cycle literacy training is currently exemplified by a couple of different programs, including the Students for Zero Waste Week. This program came out of an MPA program, specifically the Sanctuaries program, and identified life cycle literacy as an important skill set. The program brings zero waste resources and skills to schools and a wider youth audience to have a broader societal impact. I'll note that there are several such initiatives that I identified, including a subset of New York City schools are going zero waste. There's the Zero Waste Week campaign in the UK. We have the Plastic Free July um, broader social campaign. And so 
there, there's a number of ways to plug into this in, in terms of different campaigns. Um, but beyond specific campaigns, protected area sites can also model these zero waste ideas on a daily basis within site operation. This is probably post COVID, but um, it, it's a great idea to conduct waste and purchasing audits to prioritize reusable or readily recyclable uses on site. It's a lot easier to teach other people about these skills if you already know how to do it and are doing it in your own work environment. And we have information that tells us that respondents who participate in zero waste training are more likely to continue curbing their plastic consumption afterwards and in multiple spheres of their life. So another optimal objective is monitoring. And so some kind of some kind of quantitative monitoring is crucial to mitigate sources, target removal campaigns, develop producer responsibility agreements, and determine if any implemented measures are actually having a long-term impact. And this last part is vital because across this analysis, I saw that reporting the impact of a program is really key for continued stakeholder engagement. And it's hard to do that without some measurement component. I'll also point out again that we don't currently have a national monitoring program for marine debris, and so MPAs offer a potential opportunity to implement such an effort across a range of important and representative marine habitats. Many examples of monitoring campaigns already exist across protected areas around the world, some of which I highlight here that have been published in the academic literature. There are also examples of monitoring ongoing in protected areas by agencies as well. This map is the result of a snapshot study performed across National Park Service sites looking for microplastics in beach sediments, finding some of the highest concentrations in the Great Lakes sites. There are a number of platforms and resources to get started on monitoring. So this is um, there, there's a, a lot to inform your effort to make sure that you're diving into this in a correct way. Some of these cater to folks with some with more training or um, that may be conducted by dedicated personnel that involve specific types of surveys, while others resources are more geared towards ocean users and citizen scientists with app based user interfaces. But the resources are there to meet folks in a number of different ways to be able to bring monitoring together. I want to highlight that the NOAA Marine Debris Program, I, I, I use the resources extensively in this analysis, and they have a number of fantastic resources online about monitoring design and impl implementation, as well as about the overall marine debris problem, um, including the MD map effort and partnering with the University of Georgia on the Marine Debris Tracker app, uh, screenshots of which are are shown on this slide. Um, I also want to point out that the incorporation of citizen scientists in monitoring activities is a great idea. A lot of the research, um, the academic research that I showed previously was supported by citizen scientists and it's we're finding that marine debris produced by those scientists, uh, citizen scientists, um, it, it works great for further analysis and assessment purposes with a little QAQC um, by a dedicated party. And then um, I, I saw some resources in this, this project that you know, kind of questioned the utility of beach cleanups in terms of impact, but monitoring activities are more than just quantitative assessment, especially when they involve citizen scientists, in that monitoring in the form of beach cleanups may hold small-scale removal impact if maybe you know, taken up, up across one site, but these activities serve a dual purpose to reinforce objective one by building pro-environmental behavior and skills. Research tells us that folks who participate in cleanups are more likely to do so as again, as well as recognize the scope of the debris problem. And so a great example of the utility of monitoring in protected areas comes from this published study in, in 2019. And so the study looked at beverage bottles that washed up in the Tristan de Cunha Marine Protected Zone over the course of 30 years. This entailed scoring each bottle based on visible branding and language, just kind of looking at it to guess where it came from and its age. And this, or I shouldn't say guess, to, uh, to evaluate where it came from and its age. And this monitoring program showed that the source of beverage bottles drastically shifted in this protected area over the course of the period. So in 1989, most beverage bottles floated to the area from South America, whereas by 2018, the bottles were pretty new bottles that were coming from Asian ships and fishing vessels, disposing their trash overboard in violation of international shipping law. And so this, this monitoring has led to renewed conversations about the regulation of debris from shipping and waste management of by ships in this area. And finally, the last key objective for MPAs is disposal and removal. 
And again, this is already being successfully done across a range of existing protected areas, and it's a stellar place for um, MPAs to dig in. MPAs can first and foremost ensure that accessible and clear waste management options are available and well-maintained, depending on the design of the given protected area. Behavioral science tells us that people are much less likely to engage in correct waste management behaviors if waste management options are not readily available or if they are unclear in design. Research also says that using pro-environmental messages on waste management infrastructure, like putting pictures of wildlife on trash, uh, you know, signs above trash cans, has been associated with higher rates of proper waste disposal. I want to point out that beyond kind of those, those small scale um, accessibility and, and waste management issues or concerns, debris removal is also key in that especially fishing nets and, and fishing gear are quite large and require organization, safety protocols, and viable disposable options that can be more readily provided by an established conservation organization or at least organized by such an organization compared to informal efforts maybe led by a, you know, a citizen scientist or, or another such group. So while there are many great removal efforts ongoing in marine protected areas, and I highlight a few in the report, today we have time to mention just one. Um, the Goal Clean Seas Florida Keys program is a collaboration between Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, regional dive operators, and divers in the Florida Keys within the US. The program provides training to dive shops about how to remove debris safely and navigate the permitting and disposal process. Dive shops that participate are then certified as Blue Star Dive Operators, providing the business recognition of its environmentally responsible behavior. The program has been met with local and national acclaim and has removed almost 15,000 pounds of debris in its first year of operation. So I'll conclude with a teaser of another component of the report. We're not going to have time to get into the full content of the report, unfortunately. Um, but I did want to leave you with some um, recommendations about the how or how MPA should seek to implement these kind of broad objectives that were identified here. Identified five key suggestions, somewhat stepwise, with number one being that marine protected areas should start with a focus on local concerns and communities to clearly define the problem and solutions. Particularly when starting out or revising, it's also important to ensure to maximize the use of no regret solutions so as to optimize the use of resources across the many pressing concerns facing marine protected areas. Actions on marine debris should heavily rely on partnerships and networks. As mentioned before, marine debris is a huge issue and so working together promises to reach more people, mitigate more debris, and spread out the workload so that you know we don't get burnt out on having to contend with this substantial issue. The problem is also somewhat unique compared to other conservation challenges in that it's highly visible in many cases. And this should really be leveraged to show the problem, but not to evoke fear necessarily, but most importantly, to show the solutions and the impacts of actions. This is key. It is a really stunning example to be able to show folks what some of their removal or mitigation or prevention efforts are contributing to. And finally, whatever the approach, it is vital to think upstream and downstream as no one solution is effective on its own. And so this wraps up the content portion of my presentation today. I do encourage you to check out the report once it's online and that it expands on all these insights with more references and details and also offers more case studies that show these principles in action. So um, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today. I'd like to offer a big thanks to my mentor, Lauren Wenzel, the Marine Protected Area Center, and the OCTO Network for having me here today. Thank you, Dr. Roebuck. So we do have some time for questions. We have plenty of time for questions. So if you have a question, please do type it into the question box. And while we're waiting for people to type in some questions. We do have a few that have already come up during the presentation. So the first is, is there still a regulation that prohibits fishing vessels from retaining debris, example, discarded lost nets, fishing lines, or pots and traps aboard their vessels after they recover them while fishing? 
Um, I will say I'm not positive off the top of my head. I do know that a lot of the effective efforts that I saw, like the Fishing for Energy program, as well as the Hawaii Nets to Energy program, they did a really nice job of ensuring that fishing uh, fishers who brought in such gear um, had disposable disposal options. So off the top of my head, I'm not positive about that, but I would say that within the framework of that possibility, it's really key to ensure that fishers who are able to do so have strategies for disposal. Um, I talk about the Fishing for Energy program a lot in the report itself, as it's a great example of making sure that that happens. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question we have, is do you have any suggestions on how to encourage businesses to stop using multicolor or mixed plastics that are not easily recyclable? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of conversation about this topic because it is it is so complex to be to be frank. My um I, I'll say that some of this is coming in, in maybe what I've personally decided to just try to start doing in that um when I see um you know for example this is Maybe maybe showing how important this issue is, but you know when I see, um, for example, produce that's packaged in plastic at grocery stores, I am the person that goes to the store manager or calls the store and lets them know that that prevented me from purchasing that item. And so there's there's not a lot of formal networks to you know you can't necessarily like go to the website and and you know find a, a box on every every producer's website saying, hey, I'm I'm upset about your packaging. So I, I think it's important to use the tools at hand as a consumer and prioritize um, purchasing those items that are recyclable, as well as reaching out to companies when you can or stores as you can and let them know, hey, this is uh, really off-putting for me. Um, I saw one example and I'm, I'm, um, I'm not remembering the specifics of it off the top of my head. I believe it's in the report where um, a community group kept letting their grocery store know that some of this this produce packaging was just unacceptable. And the store ended up tweaking their policies to only buy produce that was not packaged as such. Um, so that would be my number one recommendation. I'll also say that um, associated with the report, we have a resource list. There's a really cool initiative called How to Recycle um, that it's um, how and then the number two and then recycle. And that organization is encouraging producers, you know, um, product producers to put directions about how to recycle each component of their um, packaging and how to recycle it properly. And so if you if you Google that resource, it's really neat and it provides a lot of information about what you need to do with each type of packaging. And that initiative encourages folks to reach out to your favorite brands and let them know that you would value something like that on their packaging to let them know you, you wanna know how to recycle it properly. Um, I would also say as like a very like high level bulk um, recommendation, the highly colored plastics one is one I'm finding in my personal life. It's a little bit easier to navigate without you know, spending an hour on Google sort of thing in that often highly inked or highly colored plastics can, can cause some of the most significant um, recycling issues. Um, and so I've, I've been trying personally, again, just to, to avoid those um, much more in, in my day-to-day -day life. Thanks. We also have a question that highlights a theme that's come up another at a number of times, and this is that the um, <clears throat> a lot of the case made for the problem focuses on individual behavior and choice, and this places the onus on the consumer for behavioral choices. However, manufacturing is a source of plastics, and manufacturing choices often leave little option for consumers. So they ask, is there not value in mandating policy for manufacturing? For example, that all manufactured plastic bottles are standard for easy recycling. Yes, absolutely. And so I want to be clear that that is the probably the single, um, I don't want to say the single, that, that's an incredibly important part of the systems change approach. The recommendations that I offer here today are really targeting protected area management and folks engaging with protected areas in that bringing together those producer responsibility agreements um, may be outside of the scope of some of the resources available. Not to say that that's not possible, but the, the manufacturing problem is a huge issue. The design problem is a huge issue. Um, that is something that needs to be wrestled with. And again, as a consumer, I would 
um, support those initiatives that are, or excuse me, those companies that are prioritizing that. Um, I would say from a protected area standpoint, though, some of the monitoring in initiatives that can tell what types of debris are more likely to be in a given environment can help guide the implementation of extended producer responsibility agreements in protected areas, for example. So that's kind of a long-winded to say, way to say that manufacturing and redesign of plastics is absolutely vital. Um, however, this is um, some of these recommendations are really focused on protected areas man managers who may have different tool sets at their um, disposal compared to nonprofits or other groups that are really engaging in remaking the policy and the infrastructure. Great, thank you. Uh, we also have a question asking, oh, I'm sorry, I seem to have lost it for a moment. So I will get back to that and ask this question. Um, do you think revitalizing or retooling the recycling process would be a valuable avenue to help as in maybe we can recycle more efficiently? Yes, absolutely. And um, I didn't have a lot of time to chat about this here today. So the recycling system has gone through just a, a very tumultuous past couple years in that um, China and a number of other Southeast Asian countries no longer accept our recycling. Um, and we're finding that it, here in the US, it's often not profitable or cost effective to recycle a lot of our products. Um, and that needs a significant change. Um, particularly with the advent of, you know, the plastic amendments that came out, there is value in revitalizing waste management and recycling. Absolutely. Um, that is a critical component of all of these R's that we have to address this problem. But this, this should be, um, you know, when, when you consider that, that inverted pyramid I had up, this should kind of be like the fail safe in that our waste management infrastructure cannot scale to the scope of production. It just can't, we can't recycle our way out of this problem. And so while we need to be sure to recycle and waste manage as much as possible and have those skills, we cannot rely on that to um, combat the fact that, you know, bananas are wrapped in plastic, that those, those sorts of, um, that there's just a real mismatch in the capabilities of the two systems. And so while um, it, it's certainly important to tackle, we, we need a, a systems approach. We can't just rely on recycling revi revitalization. Great, thank you. We also have a question asking if you know of or have any centralized platform that an NGO could use to allow their volunteers and educators to access and use the te teaching materials for schools related to Oh, that's, you know, that's a great question. I know that there are um, the, the Zero Waste Week has a lot of their resources on hand. Um, if that person wants to shoot me or if that individual wants to shoot me an email, I collected a lot of resources about folks who are implementing zero waste education and literacy. I'd be happy to share that directly with you so that I, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not certain exactly where the best pairing between NGOs and some of these resources are, um, but I can point you to where a lot of this information is and maybe um, your organization can figure out what might work best for you. Thank you, we'll go ahead and make sure that you can get connected with that person. So uh, just so that all of the attendees are aware, we are unlikely to get to all of the questions uh, in this time. There have been a lot of great questions asked, but we will forward the questions along to Dr. Roebuck. Um, we have a few questions coming in related to microplastics. So one of them asks, is there any research or recommendations on taking action on microplastics in MPAs? And another says that uh, they're desperate for a solution for preventing microplastics getting into the marine environment from washing clothes and so on on a more industrial scale. And do you have any ideas or is there anything in the pipeline that could be useful to know of related to that initiative? Yeah, so I, I have some thoughts on there. Um, I actively research microplastics in birds. So this topic is probably, um, you know, my, my comfort zone a little bit. Um, I would say, the most important thing to mitigate microplastics in protected areas is getting out the intact products um, before they become microplastics. Once in the environment, microplastics are tiny, they're expensive to remove. Um, some, um, you know, if, if you, for example, 
if you you know skim the ocean uh, surface, depending on on you know four microplastics, depending on where you are, you risk taking out some very important surface. Um, biota. And so my recommendation would be to prioritize river and coastal cleanup in that we know that a lot of um, intact debris products come down rivers and kind of wash about in the coastline and coastal area for quite some time. And getting the debris out before it is degraded into tinier and tinier pieces is much more effective than trying to get out needles in a haystack down the road. And so um, the, the upstream answer, it's not only easier, but it's more effective. If you look at the, you know, the, the microplastics I find in my birds are three to five millimeters, generally in the largest dimension. And I, I eyeballed it one day and close to a thousand microplastic particles can come from, you know, like an orange juice bottle or something. And so getting out that one orange juice bottle is going to be more effective than trying to go back and get out all of the microplastics from the environment. And again, um, this, this is easier for citizen scientists and volunteers to carry out as well. Um, in terms of the microfiber problem, um, there is abundant research saying that um, the, uh, the consumer level use of specific filters is incredibly effective. And so this might be somewhere in uh, waste literacy education that you let people know that it's even a problem. Most folks probably don't even know that this is a thing. And I'm saying this based on my, you know, my, my parents had no idea that this was an issue until, um, you know, I, I brought home one of those filters. Um, so making sure that people know about it, have access to it um, on an industrial scale. I can't say I am familiar with um, industrial scale prevention of microfiber, like at like a textile manufacturing or clothing line manufacturing level. Um, so I'll, I'll have to take take a pass on that part of the question. I'm, um, I'll, I'll sleuth around to see if there's anything I can further provide in the report, but not, not totally sure there. But microfibers are highly abundant and so much of it comes from consumers. Getting, getting that knowledge into consumers' hands is important. I'd also point out that um, waste infrastructure doesn't have, you know, sometimes um, th there, there may be differences in how different waste infrastructure deals with this. Um, so in terms of like wastewater treatment plants and whatnot. And so I, I would encourage starting a conversation with your local wastewater treatment authority to figure out if this is an item that's on their agenda and if, if they've started any monitoring for it. Um, those would be, I think, I think my recommendations. That's a great question, by the way. Your answer to that question, you noted, the, you, you reiterated the fact that most plastics come from rivers, and we have a question related to that, uh, noting that it's important to also consider that most debris comes from streams, rivers, and cities. So how do we reach the population that doesn't live in or near a marine protected area, and what is it best to monitor water, sand, marine fauna in order to, and how do we define the source of debris and how to approach these people who may live uh, far away from the protected area, but are contributing to the issue disproportionately? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I think I will I'll offer an opinion here rather than a, a concrete, um, you know, quantitative answer in that I'm, I think the best way to address upstream downstream solutions in river systems is to address watershed or uh, leverage watershed alliances and, and committee um, organizations and committees and MPA networks across that given watershed to ensure that there's cohesive messaging about the issue. Um, I would say that watershed education is really important to establish that connectivity between, um, between land and sea. Um, I would say as well that uh, some of the broader, so for example, the zero waste literacy program implemented by sanctuaries, it's not just implemented in schools that are adjacent to a marine protected area, um, but it came out of a protected area program as a resource to a, a wide range of, of schools who are interested in this. And so encouraging the use of those resources um, across networks, especially, I think could help get a broader awareness into the community about the need to consider your downstream impact. Um, in terms of the monitoring side of that question, I would suggest that it really, really depends on where you are. And I know that might not be the answer that you want to hear, but you know, for example, microfibers are so waterborne and they're so um, 
tiny that oftentimes um, some kind of toe or, or water survey will be best to detect them and quantify them, whereas heavy stuff will partition out and get into the sediments. And um, it depends on what you think your primary sources of debris are. Um, you know, for example, if you have an industrial plastic facility in your watershed, you might want to be looking for nurdles, which would primarily be in, in sediments and or in the surface layer. Um, if you think that you're concerned about consumer debris coming down a watershed, then you're probably going to want to take a look in, in sediments and coastlines as some of that debris, while it's still intact, will oftentimes get um, kind of washed back and forth within the, the tidal zone or the, the wash zone of, of rivers. Um, so again, it, it kind of depends. I'll point out that beyond me just offering some quick observations here, the NOAA Marine Debris Program has some excellent resources about how to do such monitoring. Um, and I would really encourage you to take a, a look at those further. Thank you. And you preempted the next question about if there are any programs within NOAA that have good resources. So are there any beyond the NOAA Marine Debris Program? Um, I would say that a lot of different offices across NOAA are interested and collaborate with um, this problem. Yeah, with this problem. So for example, I cited a lot of sanctuary resources within today's presentation. Um, there's a lot of research ongoing across the Ocean Service and, and other branches. The Marine Debris Program itself, though, is really a just a wealth of expertise and resources about this. And in terms of there's education resources, there's monitoring resources, there's technical reports, um, there's there's a lot there. Um, so I, I would highlight that maybe as, as a number one um, resource to use within within NOAA. Thank you. We also have a question asking if do you think a market-based measure such as a plastic tax that would drive up the cost of using plastics and provide funding for cleanup education and recycling efforts is a viable option? Yeah, I, I absolutely think it's a viable option. Um, I think that that could, especially again, I'm, I'm trying to narrow narrow um, some of my responses down to an, an MPA sort of framework in that everything that's been brought up, redesign, manufacturer, plastic tax, these are all important options that require innovation and um, could make big impacts. Um, However, I would say that some of those taxes, it might be hard to implement within a protected area depending on the framework of that area, for example. If, you, if a protected area charges admission, for example, maybe that could be a viable um, solution. Or if it you know, sells plastic goods, a plastic tax could really work. Um, the plastic tax itself, I know, is being discussed across like a, a wider cultural and social framework as a viable solution, considering that the scale of plastic production and use is so immense um, that such a tax could be really helpful. But again, from a protected areas um, angle, it really just depends on the infrastructure of, of the given area and, and the site and personnel about whether something like that could work. Thanks. And the last question for today is around when the report will be coming out, if you know, and whether or not that map that you showed earlier will be interactive and or contain parts of the Pacific that weren't didn't seem to be visible in your picture when the report does come out. Yeah, so great question. Um, the report, I would hope to be out within a few weeks. Um, this was mostly slowed down by some COVID stuff. So we're in the process of getting that edited and out. Um, it'll be emailed to all webinar participants after um, after that time as you know to let you know where it is. Um, the web map itself is interactive. You can zoom in and those, those blue spots um, change and you'll see hundreds of thousands, or not hundreds of thousands, you'll see hundreds um, of different surveys that documented marine debris. It does cover the Pacific and you can zoom into that area. Um, that is associated with the web story that will um, be announced to, or excuse me, be associated with the announcement of the report. Fantastic, thank you. So everyone keep a lookout for that report. Uh, and I'd like to say thank you, Dr. Roebuck. I know I certainly learned a lot and I hope everyone else did as well. I apologize to those whose questions we were not able to get to today, uh, but thank you for your participation and thank, thank, thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone, I enjoyed this a lot.